the 24th of May, 1941, after serving for a lively 20 years, HMS Hood's career came to an end when its after magazines detonated, sending the ship to the bottom of the ocean. Out of its 1,421-man crew, only three would survive. Today, I will be summarizing the account given by the ordinary signalman, Albert Ted Briggs. Before I get into the account, I wanted to make a few notes to clarify a few points. This is Ted Briggs' point of view. I am not going to be correcting any errors that he had made throughout his account, because there are statements he makes that goes against the official history, and I'm sure those of you who are familiar with the battle are going to be able to point those out rather quick. Even though I just called them errors, there could be every chance that they're not errors, as some of the statements he makes are on topics that have no solid answer as of today, so what he's saying could very well be true. My final note is that I'll be including some rather graphic details from Ted Briggs' account, so for those of you who are more sensitive with graphic topics, the battle section of this video might not be worth watching. The final minutes aboard Hood were quite terrifying, and since Briggs went through the hardship of recounting his experience aboard the ship, I don't want to leave those out. Briggs first saw the Hood in 1935 on the River Tees. There was a fishing boat nearby where the crew was offering to take people around the ship for five bob. Briggs' mother could not afford the price, and Briggs could not go to the Hood. This would inspire him to join the Royal Navy, though at the time he was told he was too young and he had to wait until he was 15 years old. Briggs at this stage described Hood as powerful and beautiful, though beautiful was quite an awful word to use for a battleship. But there was no other way to describe her. On the 1st of March, 1938, Briggs turned 15, and seven days later, he was in the Royal Navy. Briggs would not join Hood until the end of June 1939, when the ship came out of a refit from Portsmouth. From there, Hood would go to Scapa Flow, and in September of 1939, it, along with other ships in the home fleet, were sent to sea, and then war was declared. Briggs believed that the ships were sent out to resist a German attack or for the British to carry out their own, though he was uncertain. Going up to the Battle of the Denmark Strait, prior to discussing the battle itself, in one of Briggs' interviews, he compared the Bismarck and Hood directly, stating that both ships were the pride of their navies, and they were both handsome-looking. There was no doubt about that. Now, Briggs had the full understanding that during World War II, the German Navy was very numerically inferior to the Royal Navy, and he also had the belief that they were inferior in the readiness department for combat as well. He was aware that Bismarck and Tirpitz were under construction leading up to the Battle of the Denmark Strait. He was also aware of the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, along with the Deutschland, Admiral Scher, and Graf Spee. Briggs then states that he was unaware of the size of Bismarck and Tirpitz. He like most of Britain believed, the ships were 35,000 tons, as advertised by Germany. He was unaware that Bismarck and Tirpitz were over 50,000 tons apiece until after Hood was sunk. Information on Bismarck proved to be quite consistent and reliable. Briggs was aware when Bismarck was commissioned, and thanks to the Norwegian underground, he was also aware of when Bismarck was moving up north towards Norwegian ports in May of 1941. Briggs then goes on to discuss the Grand British Plan. The Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Tovey, aboard King George V and Scapa Flow, had made the conclusion that Bismarck was clearly going to attempt breaking out into the North Atlantic because there were a lot of convoys running between North America and Britain at that time. As a result, Tovey decided to divide his fleet. He would remain in Scapa Flow to cover the area south of Iceland. Hood and the incomplete battleship Prince of Wales along with six destroyer escorts, were sent to Iceland so they could cover the exit of the Denmark Strait and the area immediately south of Iceland, which Tovey reckoned to be the most likely course the German battleship would take. Briggs described the scene aboard Hood as rather tense. There had been many false alarms in the past regarding the battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, along with the heavy cruiser Deutschland, so... The British were unaware as to whether Bismarck was actually going to try and make a run for the North Atlantic or not. As Hood was about to enter Harfield, the heavy cruisers Suffolk and Norfolk spotted Bismarck with a heavy cruiser while they were patrolling the 8K line north of Iceland. 
The Suffolk radioed the Admiral T, and Hood began to intercept messages. There was finally confirmation that Bismarck was breaking out to the Atlantic. At that time, Hood was on a strict radio silence, but it was decided to turn the British ships on a course to intercept Bismarck, and, based off the German ship's speed and course, it was calculated that Hood would be in position to engage at 2 a.m. on the 24th of May. As a result, all of Hood's crew would man their stations at midnight, and the ships entered heavy seas, which caused the destroyers to begin to lose ground, as Hood and Prince of Wales were making 28 knots, while the destroyers were struggling to keep up. Vice Admiral Holland would signal the destroyers, Regret if you cannot keep up the speed, we will have to press on without you. And by the time Hood and Bismarck engaged one another, Briggs said that the destroyers were about 50 miles behind. Briggs then said that at 3 a.m. on the 24th of May, Hood's radar picked up Bismarck, and it was making 29 knots off Hood's starboard bow, heading towards the Atlantic. The weather and visibility were still poor, so Holland decided to run at a parallel course until the weather gave way. At this point during his interviews, Brig would discuss Holland's plan to rush the Bismarck and then go broadside when the threat of plunging fire was out. The reason for this was because of Hood's weak armored deck, which at the time Hood's armor was confidential, so most of Hood's crew was unaware of how thin the deck actually was. Briggs described the secrecy around Hood's armor as being unappreciated. In one of his interviews, Briggs stated that initially Hood's gunnery range was 20 miles, though due to its age, it was reduced to 17 by World War II, and it had an effective fighting range of 12 miles, but Holland went to close in to 8 miles. As a result of this plan, at about 4 a.m., Hood would turn towards Bismarck. Briggs then said at this point he began to feel fear. Not the fear of death, but the fear of being maimed and not being able to do anything about it. He also said that there was a lot of excitement amongst the crew, including himself, as this was the moment many of them had been waiting for, as none of them doubted Hood's capabilities as an effective fighting unit. Briggs would then discuss the positions of the men on the compass platform leading up to the battle, as the Admiral, Holland, entered the compass platform, and he would control the ship's battle from there, which is also where the captain was controlling the ship. He said that the Admiral sat in the captain's chair at the front of the platform, and the captain stood behind him. The squadron gunnery officer was standing on the platform wing. The navigating officer and officer of the watch were by the Polaris. And finally, the midshipman of the watch, Bill Dundas, whom was one of the three survivors, was on the port side of the compass platform by the phones and voice pipes. Briggs acknowledged that his position on the compass platform, with all of these important people, gave him a position to understand what was happening all the time, and he admitted that he constantly pestered the flag lieutenant to get clarification as to what was happening. At this point, he had explained to him that once action took place, Hood and Prince of Wales were intended to target the Bismarck, while the cruisers Norfolk and Suffolk would move in and take on Prince Eugen. While the ships engaged in a gunnery duel, the six British destroyers would move in and drop torpedoes on the German ships if they were still afloat. He then said that Hood visually spotted Bismarck a few minutes after 5 a.m., and they could only see the four tops of the German ships at 20 miles distance, and they would close in to roughly 12 miles before Hood opened fire first. He said that Bismarck was fine on the starboard bow, and as a result, Hood could only fire with its forward turrets, the after turrets could not bear on Bismarck, and Prince of Wales was in the same predicament. He said that Hood fired about six salvos before Bismarck responded, and he assumed this was because they took the Germans by surprise, as the Germans were aware of Norfolk and Suffolk, because they were shadowing it, but the Germans didn't know about Hood and Prince of Wales being in the area because of the strict radio silence the ships had been keeping. Then Briggs would discuss one of the fatal mistakes Hood had made, and that was that it was shooting at the wrong ship. Prince Eugen was leading, Bismarck was trailing. The last Hood knew... Bismarck was leading, and Prince Eugen was trailing. The mistake was not realized until several salvos had been fired, as, from a distance, they could only see the four tops of the two ships, meaning identification was impossible. He said as a result, Hood had to adjust its fire to Bismarck, 
and then he claimed that Hood scored a hit on Bismarck with what he believed was the third salvo on Bismarck, which he attributed as the hit that would cause Bismarck to leak oil. Around the time Bismarck opened fire on Hood, Briggs noted that Bismarck's fire was quite accurate, and this is when the reality settled in so hard that the event seemed unreal, almost like a movie. The experience was difficult for Briggs to take in at the time. He said that the men below decks were being regularly updated on what was happening through the intercom, but he said that's not quite compared to what he could see since he was on the Compass platform where he had visuals of what was occurring. In one of his interviews that would be used in a 1996 documentary, Briggs was asked to describe the sound Bismarck shells made as they screeched towards Hood, and he described it as a train going through a tunnel. That was the best way he could think of describing it. The interviewer would then ask him, was this a terrifying noise? And Briggs said, yes, yes it was. Briggs would then follow that up saying that while it was terrifying to hear that, he was still being hit with the unreality of the event. He would then go back to Bismarck. The Bismarck's third salvo went over Hood, the fourth one fell short of Hood, and the fifth one hit. He was made aware that the shell hit aft, though, because the compass platform was enclosed and the funnels were in the way, they could not see the hit from the compass platform, but they knew the ship was hit because they were thrown off their feet and had to get back up. He said the gunnery officer walked out onto the starboard platform wing and looked aft, came back in, and said that the shell hit at the base of the mainmast, causing a fire on the starboard side amongst the 4-inch ready-use ammunition lockers. He said that the captain then ordered the fire be left be until the 4-inch ammunition had cooked off so no more crew was killed, and that all unwounded personnel cleared the boat deck to avoid being wounded from the ammunition exploding. After that, Hood was hit once again, and, as Ted Briggs said, by that time there had been another one which couldn't have exploded, but a shell I think went through the spotting top, and there were bodies falling down on the wingsail bridge. Bill Dundas, the midshipman, walked out on the wing, and there was one. We knew every officer in the ship, naturally. But there was one young lieutenant. No face, no hands. The only way you could tell he was a lieutenant was by the two stripes. Briggs said Hood had finally made it to the range that Holland wanted to get into, and he ordered that both ships turn to get their after turrets online. And just as Hood was turning, another salvo came in and struck the ship. Once again, the men in the compass platform were thrown off their feet and had to get back up. Briggs said, personally, he did not hear an explosion, but when he got back up, a huge sheet of flame wrapped around the front of the compass platform and blocked visuals. He said that the atmosphere was very calm until he could start to hear the screams following the flames wrapping around the platform. Once he was stably back on his feet, he realized that Hood was starting to list to starboard. He said it went no more than 10 degrees, and then it started to return to an even keel. At that time, through the voice pipe, he heard the quartermaster say, steering gear gone, sir. He said the captain replied, change over to emergency conning. As he had said that, the ship started to list to port. Once it had reached about 30 or 40 degrees, they realized she wasn't coming back, and the men started to escape the platform. The order to abandon ship wasn't necessary. Briggs saw Dundas escape by kicking out one of the armor-plated windows in which he sprained his ankle, and Briggs said he had no idea how Dundas managed to break the window. Briggs moved towards the compass platform exit, where he met the squadron navigating officer, Commander Warren, whom stood to the side, gave a grin, and gestured Briggs to go through first. Briggs exited the compass platform through the starboard door, where he would then work his way down a ladder towards the Admiral's Bridge, directly underneath, and when he was halfway down that ladder, the water reached him, and he was washed off the ship. The suction of the ship sinking would begin to drag Briggs down with it, and it would pull him deeper and deeper into the water, and his panic soon turned into a calm nature, as he was no longer afraid of death, and at this point, a huge rush of air exited the ship, and it forced him back to the surface, where he could begin gasping for air. Once Briggs realized what was happening, he turned to look around at the hood, 
where he saw the ship sticking vertically in the air when compared to the waterline, just as B-turret was beginning to submerge. At this point, he always described the ship as being about 50 yards away. Briggs turned around as Hood had carried a set of detachable rafts, which did successfully eject from the ship when it sank, and he grabbed onto one of them. He was unable to pull himself up onto it, so he would just cling onto it for the next four hours. When he turned around to look at the Hood again, it was gone, and there was a fire around the water where it had been. He then realized he was in the midst of its oil, and so he began to swim away from where Hood once was to get out of the oil, so the fire didn't spread to him. He said by the time he exited the oil, the fire had died out. As far as injuries went, Briggs was largely unscathed. When he was gasping for air upon resurfacing, he did drink in a little bit of oil, but nothing fatal. HMS Electra would arrive four hours after the sinking, which Electra was one of the six destroyers Hood had left behind hours before, and it would rescue all three survivors. Briggs did not grasp the reality of what had occurred until he had arrived back in Britain and exited a taxi to see his mother. Once he saw her, the realization of what had occurred settled in. The rest is history. Briggs would remain in the Royal Navy for the next three decades, where he would retire at the rank of lieutenant. After that, he would infamously go on to carry out multiple interviews, and he would also head the HMS Hood Association. He would eventually go on to pass away on the 4th of October, 2008, at the age of 85. Like the other two crew members, he had requested upon his death that he be cremated, and his ashes spread over the wreck of the Hood. With that having been said, that is the entirety of Ted Briggs' account in a summarized format. Hopefully you have learned something new or taken away an important message from Ted Briggs' words of his own tragic experience, and this video was made in the memory of him and all of those who were lost aboard Hood.